It's the ultimate East meets West aviation gathering. China, the USA, Russia, India and France vie for the limelight in Dubai at the second most important air show of the year. Hello, welcome to a brand new episode of Airshow Dispatches. Yes, back again. I jumped the gun last episode by saying it was the last one of the year, but then I saw the lineup for the Airshow here in Dubai, an opportunity came knocking, and here I am at this fantastic Airshow, 190 aircraft on static display, uh, but an incredibly varied show in the air. Uh, aircraft from a huge number of nations, many of them indigenous products that very rarely perform overseas. I can't wait uh, to show you what's been going on here over the past week. Here is a look at the lineup and running order. We start with the epic F-15 QA display, followed by the J-10Cs of August the 1st, then into our local Emirati display acts. The India versus Pakistan showdown follows with the J-17 and the Tejas, then the wonderful Sarang display team, airliners followed by the Russian Knights, then a bit of rotary action, the F-35 is towards the end of the programme, as is the Rafale, and we close with a Frecce Tricolori. But we start with the real head-turner of the week, a very significant flying display debut, with the F-15 QA Ababil from the Qatar Amiri Air Force making its first ever airshow appearance. And what a way to start with an extremely abrupt pull to the vertical. This is one of the finest solo fast jet displays I have ever seen by a Western fighter. A collaboration between Qatar and Boeing using an operational Qatari jet paired with Boeing test pilot Jason Dotter. seen this before in all my years of air shows, an aircraft exiting a reverse half Cuban straight into a high alpha low speed pass. Then showing off its 58,000 pounds of thrust by powering from that low and slow manoeuvre into a half vertical eight, half a loop, half a roll and then another half loop on top of that. the latest members of the F-15 family, a highly modified version of the Strike Eagle developed for Qatar. Compared with the familiar F-15E, the F-15 QA features two additional underwing hardpoints, more thrust, active electronically scanned array radar and a new flight control system with no angle of attack limits. Qatar ordered 36 F-15 QAs back in 2017 to replace their Mirage 2000s. The first example took to the air in 2020 and deliveries began in October 2021. Such was the potency of this aircraft that the US Air Force decided to order 104 of them to replace the F-15C. American service, it's known as the F-15 EX Eagle II. The F-15 EX is more or less identical to the F-15 QA that we see here. The main difference is that this aircraft has an Israeli anti-jamming system and the EX has an electronic warfare suite from the United States. The 
aircraft in this display demonstrating about a 17 degree per second sustained turn rate, which is roughly typical for American fighters. Well, we've also seen demonstrated an instantaneous pitch rate around 45 degrees per second, which is immensely impressive. The F-15 ends its quite remarkable demonstration with, I kid you not, a tail slide. Admittedly, pylons and CFTs have been removed for the air show to make this aircraft as light and sleek as possible, but what a tremendous display nonetheless. Here comes the National Aerobatic Team of China. It's the People's Liberation Army Air Force, August the 1st, also known as Bai Yi. The team flies the 4.5 generation J-10CY, a sub-variant of the J-10C that has been specifically designed for aerobatic team duties. It made its first flight only last year and made its airshow debut at Lima Langkawi in May 2023. Typical J-10C represents quite a big jump in capability compared to older models of the J-10. Most notably, it has a powerful Chinese WS-10B engine rather than the previous Russian Saturn AL-31FN. It has locally produced active electronically scanned array radar, PL-10 infrared homing missiles and PL-15 beyond visual range air-to-air -air missiles. These J-10CYs are not standard J-10Cs though. They have no cannon, they've been fitted with a dorsal spine from the J-10D, and they've also reverted to the Russian engines used by the older J-10A and S models. So why have they reverted to the older engine? Well, it's sometimes said that the AL-31FN is a little more responsive to changes in power setting, but the more important reason is because August the 1st still use old twin-seat J-10SYs equipped with AL-31Fs. It's much easier for everyone if the whole squadron uses the same type of engine. Here is a new manoeuvre being performed at an international air show for the very first time. One aircraft barrel rolling around the rest of the formation, and then as the formation banks to turn away from the crowd, the whole group neatly transitions into Delta. The team use smoke in a rather interesting way. Each aircraft produces just one smoke colour, but the colour combination changes from one display to the next. And yes, that is an absolute nightmare when trying to combine footage from two different performances. You'll notice some of this footage was taken on the Thursday with the main formation using red, yellow and blue smoke, and some is taken on the Friday when they used red and white smoke. The lack of flexibility with the smoke does present some challenges. Not least, you'll notice that there's very little use of afterburner in this display. aircraft could produce white smoke in addition to their chosen colour, afterburner wouldn't be a huge problem. But with the afterburner engaged, the jet flux becomes far too hot for the dyes in the coloured smoke, which would burn and turn the smoke black or brown.
of uh, pretty much every other aerobatic team using afterburning aircraft, they have the option of using white smoke at any time they like, but August the 1st don't have that. Hence the power settings in this performance are very much on the conservative side compared to, for example, the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds. In this case, smoke on means afterburners off. The display routine itself is a little bit vanilla. You won't see any manoeuvres here that aren't also performed by most other jet aerobatic teams. The formations aren't especially tight and there are also some pretty long pauses as the team repositions between manoeuvres. The performance definitely feels like a work in progress. August the 1st previously visited Dubai in 2017 and their return to the region comes at a time when Gulf states are actively looking to diversify their inventories and reduce their dependence on Russian and American equipment. Neighbouring Saudi Arabia is said to be interested in purchasing the J-10CE to replace their ageing tornadoes. Meanwhile, Egypt is negotiating an order for at least 12 J-10s after pulling out of a deal to acquire the Su-35 because of the war in Ukraine. Notice in the second half of this show, every single manoeuvre starts from the left-hand side, a low complexity and rather formulaic way of managing the airspace. But a break from that usual format for the very last manoeuvre, five aircraft arriving from the front, coloured smoke on, asymmetrical in this case as a result of that constant shuffling of the smoke colours from one display to the next and this is the blooming break. The UAE Air Force showcased its own combat equipment including their excellent F-16E Desert Falcon solo display. This display is short but very sweet. It lasts just six minutes, but it is absolutely relentless with no downtime between manoeuvres and perhaps the highest intensity of any F-16 display in the world at the moment. aircraft, it's astonishing to think the F-16 will celebrate its 50th anniversary next year. It remains the most numerous fixed-wing combat aircraft in operation globally. It's still highly potent and very much in production. F-16E is the second most advanced version of the F-16 globally, like the brand new F-16V Viper. It is a modernised version of the venerable F-16C developed for and funded by the Emirati Air Force. A 60 degree turn demonstrating about 14 degrees per second sustained here. F-16s can turn a lot tighter than that and my mind is drawn particularly to our episode from the Radom air show uh, in August which featured the Danish F-16 AM demonstrating about 25 degrees per second of sustained turn rate in that case. The 
deliveries of the F-16E began in 2004 and today the aircraft forms the backbone of the UAE's combat fleet. It flies alongside the Mirage 2000-9 with around 80 examples of each in service. This was the first variant of the F-16 to feature active electronically scanned array radar. Well, the second variant if you count the Mitsubishi F-2. Compared to a standard F-16C, it also has slightly more thrust, a newer electronic warfare system, a built-in FLIR laser targeting system, and a new fibre-optic data bus capable of transferring data a thousand times faster than the older bus found on the F-16C. And here's the Mirage 2000, the UAE now being the only nation on Earth to perform a fully aerobatic Mirage 2000 display. Mirage 2000 was the last member of the long-standing Dassault Mirage family to enter service, and the Mirage 2000-9s operated by the UAE are among the most advanced Mirages on the planet. It's based on the Mirage 2000-5 Mark II, operated by the French Air Force, which, unlike previous Mirage 2000s, have glass cockpits, faster computer systems, improved strike capabilities and far more advanced radar. I love this crazy flying of the style we usually see from the likes of the MB339. Incredible to see that kind of manoeuvrability being performed by a heavy Delta Wing fighter. Absolutely outstanding. UAE operates 32 new build Mirage 2000-9s delivered from 2003 until 2006, as well as a fleet of much older Mirage 2000s ordered in the 1980s which have since been upgraded to Dash 9 standard. The UAE's Mirage fleet is due to begin winding down in 2026 and the type will be fully retired by around 2030, replaced by the Rafale F4. The newer Mirage 2000s still have plenty of service life left in them, however, and will likely be gifted or sold to another air arm. Greece, Egypt and Morocco are the most likely destinations. High Alpha Pass coming up. The Delta Wing is quite high drag in some flight regimes, such as sustained turns, but it really comes into its own during manoeuvres like this. Now, most aircraft that have good high alpha performance either have a V tail or they have a large vertical stabiliser for directional stability. The Mirage 2000 doesn't really have either. Instead, it has strakes down by the engine intakes, energising the air and deflecting some of it up towards the tail. That, in turn, allowed Dassault to fit a much smaller vertical stabiliser than would have otherwise been possible, making substantial savings in both weight and drag.
It's a very comfortable aircraft to fly in a high alpha regime though. I'd happily sit in a sustained turn at about 25 degrees of alpha. Yes, generating a huge amount of drag, but also a huge amount of lift. We're about to see another very high alpha manoeuvre in a few seconds time. A loaded roll with a peak angle of attack of around 40 degrees. demonstrates not just how much Alpha the Mirage 2000 can sustain, but also how much control authority the pilot retains at those very high angles of attack. But we can't talk about the UAE Air Force without showing Fazan al Emirat with their 7 MB339s. It was in the late 2000s that the UAE decided to set up their own national aerobatic team and they studied the world's very best for inspiration and mentorship. In the end, they partnered with Italy, home of aircraft manufacturer Elenia Ermacchi and the world-famous Frecce Tricolori, to bring their vision to life. The UAE ordered 10 MB339 NATs, a version of the MB339A modified for aerobatic team duties, and received a mix of new-build jets and second-hand ex-Italian examples retrofitted by the manufacturer. The main difference, of course, the addition of a bi-coloured smoke system, identical to that used by the Frecce Tricolori. And now, indeed, the coloured smoke comes on for the Alvazan al Emirat bomber. Initially, the aircraft were painted in desert camouflage and crewed by full-time flight instructors. They made their debut at the Al Ain Air Show 2010 with a short non-aerobatic performance. But following that, the team members headed to Italy to train with a Frecce Tricolori before debuting their full aerobatic routine at the Dubai Air Show in November 2011. Now this is a manoeuvre unique to Al Vazan. One aircraft approaches from either direction before they cross pulling up into the vertical as both aircraft perform synchronised launch of acts at opposite ends of the display line. Only two jet aerobatic teams in the world perform a launch of act, but Alvazan is the only one to fly it with multiple aircraft simultaneously. This is a display packed with symbolism. Seven jets to represent the seven emirates, wonderfully pretty black and gold paint schemes to denote the desert sand and the riches of the oil hidden beneath it, and absolutely phenomenal smoke systems producing thick plumes of red, white, green and black. 
This is pretty much the home show for Al Vassan Al Emirat. They're based at Al Minad Air Base, which is only about 10 miles away. They perform globally, however. This year alone, they've flown at air shows in Malaysia, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. Previous trips have taken them as far afield as China, Switzerland, Slovakia, and Morocco. These MB339s are expected to reach the end of their service lives by 2030 and thus a new aircraft has been selected to replace them. We're going to see the replacement for these MB339s very shortly. And when we do see it, you'll appreciate just how big a change it'll be for the team. They could hardly swap to a more different aircraft as their next mount. A 360 degree turn here, demonstrating about 20 degrees per second sustained turn rate. And uh, as is often the case, these trainers actually having better turn performance than frontline fighters. It just goes to show why they're so well suited for the air show role. straight wings of course. You won't find them on any fighter aircraft. They do lend an awful lot of structure to the formation shapes and they're a big factor of why this team is quite so visually attractive to watch. And this is the sort of manoeuvre that they won't be able to fly anymore. The tail slide. But I do want to draw a distinction between this and the tail slides that we're seeing from the likes of the F-15 and later on the Su-35. This is a true tail slide with the aircraft actually sliding back down inside its own smoke trail. The heavy jets don't quite perform a true tail slide. It's more of a very high alpha arc with the aircraft always maintaining some forward motion. Those big afterburning engines don't like having turbulent air pass through them backwards and the fly-by-wire control software generally isn't too happy about the idea of going backwards either. Now this is quite an interesting manoeuvre, a twisted loop, uh, initially pulling up in a very tricky card 6 formation, then uh, compressing into chevron on the way over the top, is not a quarter clover because the 90 degree shift occurs on the down line rather than the up line, but the consequential thing is the aircraft are now departing away from us, pulling up again and about to split into two sections, the smoke will go on and they will draw a heart. It's often said that uh, Alvazan have uh, more than a passing similarity to the Frecce Tricolori, uh, and I've long maintained they very much have their own identity. I'd hold this manoeuvre up as a, a good example of that, uh, shunning the uh, very distinctive Frecce Tricolori way of drawing a heart from bottom to top and doing it the more conventional way from top to bottom. We'll see the Frecce's heart later on in the programme, and you'll be able to uh, compare the two methods directly. And here's another manoeuvre that's a bit like something the Frecce Tricolori do, but also not like what they do. Uh, this is called the Flag Cross. It has a passing similarity to the final manoeuvre of the Frecce Tricolori, which we will see in around an hour's time. And as you'll notice, it's the same, but it's also different.
Now many aerobatic teams have a trademark, that one manoeuvre which we always picture when we imagine them. That recurring photo that's always popping up if you type the team's name into a Google image search. Well, Fazan Al Emirat most certainly have a trademark. It is one of the most recognisable and distinctive pieces of airshow imagery of the 21st century. And here it is, the UAE DNA. Filling the sky with their national colours, that was the unmistakable finale of Al Fazan Al Emirat. Here is the aircraft that will replace those MB339s, the Hongdu L15A Falcon. The L15, also known as the JL10, was designed primarily as a lead-in fighter trainer for the People's Liberation Army Air Force. Work began in the year 2000, with the first prototype taking to the air five years later. The L-15 is available in various configurations, both as a subsonic and supersonic trainer, and as a light attack platform with up to nine weapons hardpoints, capable of carrying beyond visual range air-to-air -air missiles and satellite-guided bombs. This is an L-15A, a non-afterburning training version. In 2023, the UAE ordered 12 of these jets to replace Alphazan's MB339s. While this aircraft hasn't been formally handed over to the UAE Air Force yet, this very airframe will soon belong to them, and the black and gold paint scheme is indicative of its future role. A follow-up order of around 30 more L-15s could be in the pipeline as well, with the UAE being in desperate need of a replacement for their mothballed Hawks. An interesting smoke system, as you can see, two smoke colours per aircraft, with each colour being delivered to a different exhaust bucket. That means the aircraft is capable of producing two streams of smoke of different colours at the same time, should the pilot so desire. It's difficult to know if the pilot is just playing gently, but while this display was very graceful, it did feel a little bit like it was playing out in slight slow motion. To give you an example, turn rate was just 15 degrees per second in a 360 degree Schneider turn. That's a 25% reduction in turn performance compared to what we saw from the MB339. Here's another Chinese-designed aircraft, the JF-17A Thunder. This was an historic airshow moment, the first time that the JF-17 and its Indian arch rival, the Tejas, had participated in the same airshow. The JF-17 was designed in China by the Chengdu Aircraft Corporation, using mainly Chinese components and subsystems, but the aircraft are largely assembled in Pakistan. The project was launched in 1991, the aim being to develop a low-cost multi-role fighter to replace Pakistan's ageing fleet of Soviet-era equipment, with China taking charge in 1999. The JF-17 was designed to be cheap, and it is the cheapest aircraft in its class. But 
but that has come at the cost of operational capability. The initial production versions have no beyond visual range air-to-air capability and very limited air-to-ground function. They also use some fairly low-spec components. The Russian engines used on the initial versions are notoriously unreliable, as was the radar, while the data link failed to work to the required standard. That is being rectified with the all-new JF-17C Block 3, which was on show in the static display in Dubai. The Block 3 features far more advanced sensors and avionics, including active electronically scanned array radar, BVR air-to-air, infrared search and track, one additional weapons hardpoint, a more powerful and reliable engine, and greater use of composite materials. The first Block 3 jets entered service in 2021. The JF-17 has seen modest export success to Myanmar and Nigeria, but all those exported aircraft have since been grounded due to fuselage cracks. And here's India's own light multi-role fighter, the Tejas Mark I. This is the result of a painfully long and slow program. Work started on this aircraft in 1983 and it didn't enter service until 2015. The initial version of the Tejas could take on considerably more missions than the Block 1 JF-17. It had beyond visual range air-to-air -air capability from the start, as well as being able to launch cruise missiles, precision-guided munitions and laser-guided bombs. The Tejas has since been outpaced by the JF-17 Block 3, so Hindustan Aeronautics responded with the Tejas Mark 1A. The Mark 1A includes active electronically scanned array radar and electronic countermeasure capability delivered by a detachable underwing pod. The first Mark 1As will enter service in 2024. After that, the manufacturer aims to start production of the Tejas Mark II, an enlarged aircraft with more power and more payload, as well as a full onboard electronic warfare suite. While this is potentially a very nice aircraft on paper, that is only half the story. Four decades after the project started, only around 40 aircraft have actually been delivered, of which half are used for test purposes and aren't fit for combat. No export orders have yet materialised, and that is probably the result of delays, cost overruns and a sluggish production rate. As it stands, Hindustan Aeronautics can produce just eight aircraft per year. The JF-17's production rate is about three times faster. Sadly, the Tejas didn't have a great time in Dubai. Technical problems forced one display to be cancelled and another to be aborted just after takeoff. Not the aesthetics that India would have hoped for during its first JF-17 showdown. That's a shame, really, because the Tejas was quite an enjoyable watch, with a display that was not especially remarkable, but certainly tighter and more fluid than that of the JF-17.
Now this is a display team which I've wanted to see for a very long time now, Sarang, also from the Indian Air Force. Sarang is the Sanskrit word for peacock, and the team's aircraft are painted to represent that animal. The aircraft in question is the Dhruv Advanced Light Helicopter, developed by Hindustan Aeronautics. This is the only multi-aircraft display team in the world currently using an Indian-designed aircraft type, and one of only five multi-aircraft military display teams using helicopters. It certainly makes for a refreshing change among all of the fast jet aerobatic teams that we see here in Dubai. Of course, in many ways, it is considerably more complex to choreograph compared to a fixed-wing display, not least because these aircraft can't get very close together. The rotors themselves extend far beyond the footprint of the fuselage and generate a huge amount of downwash, which is potentially very dangerous to fly into. So Sarang make great use of on-crowd manoeuvres, where they can create the illusion of the aircraft being much closer together than they actually are, and it works very effectively. No illusions here though, the aircraft pull up in a loose line abreast formation for synchronised pedal turns. And the soloist quickly chases them down to join back up with the formation, they'll get turned around and fly back towards us for one of those uh, illusions I was describing earlier. The aircraft will actually be offset from each other uh, depth-wise by quite a considerable distance, but you can't tell that from this angle as they split in an opposition break. The Dhruv first flew in 1992, but wasn't introduced to service until 2002. It is available in both military and civilian guises, primarily as a general utility platform, but specialised versions for search and rescue and maritime patrol are also available. A light attack variant can be armed with up to four rocket pods and is fitted with a 20mm cannon under the nose. And there are also new military versions of the Dhruv, which come equipped with an electronic warfare suite for improved survivability. The Dhruv was the first Indian aircraft type to see widespread export success, with more than 300 examples produced and five nations use it in a military capacity. The Sarang display team was formed in 2003, just one year after the Dhruv entered service. They made their airshow debut in Singapore the following year at the Asian Aerospace Show. And they've since performed internationally on several occasions, including during a British tour in 2008, followed by visits to Bahrain, Dubai and Sri Lanka in more recent years. Now, the rotary displays were at a bit of a disadvantage here in Dubai. At most air shows, there are different display lines for different categories of aircraft. In the UK, a helicopter can fly 150 metres from the crowd, a fast jet will fly 230 metres from the crowd. In Dubai, everything was on the same display line, which, as far as I could tell, was roughly 
500 metres in front of the crowd line. Not ideal for anything, especially not for the rotary displays. So Saranga are doing a great job here in filling the skies uh, despite the challenging circumstances. I've seen several other rotary display teams over the years. I don't think I've ever seen one attempt to draw a heart before. That is mightily impressive. I can only imagine it's a highly challenging manoeuvre to complete symmetrically. And in they come now for their final manoeuvre, the Sarang split. Watch for the team leader to pull up into the vertical, then into the hover, before bowing in salute to the nation of India. lovely display. Uh, but now onto something completely different and making its second Dubai Airshow appearance, here is the latest commercial product from Boeing, the 777X. Following the end of 747 and A380 production, the 777X is the largest passenger aircraft currently on the market. Compared to previous 777s, the 777-9 has a wider cabin and an optimised seating layout, which will seat 426 passengers in a standard two-class configuration. That's 30 passengers more than the 777-300 with a comparable cabin layout, and 15 more than the A350-1000. In other changes, it's got an all-new composite wing, which is so long that the tips need to fold upwards on the ground to enable the aircraft to fit into a typical parking space. It also has the all-new GE9X engine, which boasts a roughly 10% improvement in efficiency and a 15% improvement in takeoff thrust compared to its predecessor, the GE90X, used on many of the previous generation of 777s. It's been a troubled program though, it was supposed to enter service in 2019 but that has now been postponed until at least 2025. Those delays have been a particular flashpoint here in Dubai where Emirates have been outspoken critics of the 777X program. They originally ordered 150 of the aircraft but then cut that order back by 35 in protest over the delays. Having said that, on day one of this year's Dubai Air Show, they did then reinstate those cancelled orders and then ordered a further 55 jets on top of that, which is perhaps reflecting the fact that when it comes to very large passenger aircraft, there really is only one option nowadays, even if it does face continuing uncertainty over its development timeline. The display pilot here is Mike Bryan, he's been flying air displays for Boeing for the last 26 years. This was the final display flight of his career and he ends with a very impressive wing over at 88 degrees a bank. And here's the largest Airbus product, the A350-1000.
It seats 350 to 410 passengers in a typical configuration, which is just slightly less than the 777X we saw a moment ago. The A350 has seen enormous sales success in this region. Qatar Airways was the launch customer. It's currently the second largest operator of the type with 58 aircraft in service. And that accounts for about 10% of the world's current active A350 fleet. Qatar Airways hasn't always been a happy customer though. A row erupted in 2021 when peeling paint was discovered on 24 of their aircraft. Qatari authorities said it was a safety issue and grounded the jets. European authorities said it wasn't, it was purely a cosmetic issue. The whole thing went to court in the UK earlier this year and was very suddenly settled on unknown terms in February. Airbus has since changed some of the materials it uses in the fuselage coatings to prevent the issue from reoccurring. Several other regional airlines have been big customers for this type. Emirates, for example, have ordered 50, with the first due to be delivered in 2024. Really, Emirates would rather have had a smaller number of A350s and a few more A380s, but uh, uh, A380 production has now ended, meaning that is no longer an option. And now for a second time, I find myself saying time for something completely different, because here come the Russian knights. The Russian Knights are not a normal aerobatic team. They use operational aircrew who come together just a few weeks before an airshow to practice an aerobatic routine and then they disperse back to their normal squadrons after the show is complete. The, shall we say, high operational tempo of the Russian Air Force at the moment has meant that there haven't been many opportunities for the team to perform of late. This is only their second public air show of 2023 following a rather chaotic appearance at Lima Langkawi earlier this year. After flying for many years with the Su-27, the team got a new fleet of Su-30 SMs in 2017. Two years later, they started a gradual shift to the Su-35, which made them the first aerobatic team in the world to fly 4.5 generation fighters. Nowadays, there are eight Su-35s and eight Su-30s in Russian Knights colours, but paint scheme aside, these are fully operational aircraft. In fact, in September, the Russian Air Force used aerobatic team jets to escort 295 bombers on patrol missions over the Barents Sea, perhaps indicative of just how stretched the Russian Air Force is nowadays, with about 10% of their Su-30s having been destroyed in Ukraine.
The Su-35 started out in the mid-1980s as a modernised thrust vectoring testbed based on the Su-27. In terms of payload and manoeuvrability, it showed great promise, but it wasn't put into production. The idea was revived in the year 2000 when Russia identified the need for a stopgap fighter due to delays with its Su-57 programme. Production began in 2007, with the first Su-35 finally entering service in 2009. Like most stop gaps though, corners were cut and shortcuts were made. It has passive rather than active electronically scanned array radar, for example, which is a downgrade from many Su-30s. You'll notice that unlike the Su-30SM used by the Russian Knights until fairly recently, there are no canards on the Su-35. Sukhoi decided that the penalty in weight was too large to justify given thrust vectoring and modern flight control software, which is now so advanced that the aircraft can achieve a similar level of manoeuvrability without those canards installed. Instead, there are some extra antennae where the canards were once fitted. Now this is mightily impressive. The Russian Knights are the only jet aerobatic team in the world to perform this manoeuvre. They pitch up on the 45 degree line to just shy of the vertical. The airspeed bleeds away and then we shall see a formation tail slide. And this is where the display gets really exciting. You'll see the benefits of the Su-35's omnidirectional vector thrust with 30 degrees of vectoring available. Now to put that into perspective, the F-22, which is the only Western vector thrust fighter in service, can only vector its thrust in one dimension and at a maximum of 20 degrees of offset. And that vector thrust will be demonstrated to us through some very impressive solo manoeuvres. But first, the team run in from in front of us on the B axis for an opposition derry turn. Both aircraft rolling through 270 degrees in opposing directions before crossing in the middle. into a sequence of opposition passes. Reposition between these two passes, synchronized. 
pedal turns. This made possible by the thrust vectoring. Both engines actually vectoring their thrust in slightly different directions at this point. There's almost no air going over the wings, so the conventional control surfaces almost useless. The nose rotating at around 45 degrees per second during that pedal turn, more than double the turn rate that any pilot could hope to achieve in a conventional maximum rate turn. pounds of thrust on this aircraft. It's the most powerful fighter that we'll see today. And another incredible bit of thrust vectoring. First, a very high alpha roll straight into a Cobra stance. An extreme high alpha pass at about 80 degrees angle of attack. this useful in combat? Well, almost certainly not. But my goodness, it's impressive, isn't it? Here's another Russian aircraft, their very distinctive coaxial K-52 Alligator. There are a number of reasons why this unusual rotor blade arrangement is beneficial. Among them, more efficient use of power. All your engine power is being used to generate lift and none of it is being wasted on a tail rotor that makes the aircraft controllable but doesn't otherwise contribute to its performance. Coaxial helicopters are also more stable. While a helicopter with just one main rotor, as soon as you introduce any form of airspeed, the advancing half of the rotor generates slightly more lift than the receding half, making the aircraft fundamentally unbalanced. This dual rotor layout mitigates that. It also makes the aircraft highly agile. This rotor design enables the aircraft to perform maximum rate turns at up to 3.5 G at any airspeed. And we see that demonstrated on several occasions during this display. That manoeuvrability is very important in this case because the K-52 was originally designed as a single-seat helicopter with no weapon systems operator. So to make life easier for the pilot, it has a fixed angle cannon. In other words, the cannon can only point in the direction that the helicopter is pointing in, so best-in-class manoeuvrability is absolutely essential. Rostec liked to boast at the Dubai Air Show that the K-52 is battle-proven, but its most recent wartime use has not exactly been a glorious triumph. It's proved to be a reasonable anti-tank platform, but it is highly vulnerable to ground fire, particularly to man pads. Somewhere between 25 and 30 K-52s have been shot down during the war in Ukraine, and in total at least a quarter of Russia's K-52 fleet has been damaged or destroyed. What does work in the K-52's favour, though, is its survivability. Due to that rotor layout, K-52s can fly even if their tail has been shot off, if the damage is worse than that, then the pilots have the option of ejecting. This was the first mass production helicopter to feature ejection seats. And worst case scenario, the high cockpit position and extensive armour give good protection to the crew in a crash landing.
The result is that an abnormally high proportion of crews involved in those Ukrainian shootdowns did ultimately survive. Here's a more conventional helicopter design, the KAI light armed helicopter, making its international flying display debut. This aircraft was developed to replace Korea's aging MD-500 defenders and AH-1S Cobras in the close air support, light attack and reconnaissance roles. It was developed from the Eurocopter EC-155 Dorfan under an agreement that saw KAI take over principal manufacturing of the Dorfan from 2018. The light-armed helicopter features various improvements over the EC-155, including new cockpit instruments, a modified gearbox and redesigned rotor blades. Most importantly, it can also carry various weapons systems, including a 20mm turret gun, up to two unguided rocket pods or four anti-tank missile launchers. The LAH is also fitted with an electro-optic infrared sensor package and a self-protection electronic warfare suite. The first flight occurred in 2019 with three prototypes having been produced to date. No firm orders have been placed so far, but the manufacturer expects to produce around 100 aircraft for the Korean Armed Forces and is also pitching the helicopter to potential overseas customers. Back to the fast jets now, and here we have an F-16C Fighting Falcon from the United States Air Force. This is not the US Air Force's main Viper demo team. What we see here is the Pacific Air Force's F-16 demonstration team, which is part of the 35th Fighter Wing based at Misawa in Japan. They perform at just a few shows a year, mostly in Asia, and their display sequence is very similar to that of the main US-based team. The Block 30 was the first model of F-16 that was designed to be compatible with multiple engine types, and this one would have left the factory with a General Electric F-110 rather than the traditional Pratt & Whitney F-100. Block 30 F-16s were produced from 1986 until 1989, and they were a notable step up from the Block 25, adding compatibility with the AIM-120 air-to-air missile and AGM-88 anti-radiation missile. Today, these are the oldest F-16s serving with the US Air Force, but they remain highly relevant, having been upgraded to F-16C++ standard. Improvements include a new guidance system and electronic warfare suite, JDAM compatibility and lightning targeting pods. Here comes the US Air Force's latest fighter, the F-35A Lightning II, displaying in a mild dust storm. sound of the Pratt & Whitney F-135 producing 43,000 pounds of thrust, and that makes it one of the most powerful single engines ever applied to a fighter aircraft.
It is not humid in Dubai. It is the opposite of humid. Uh, but the F-35 and the F-35 alone, always capable of extracting some vapour. Sustained turn rate about 15 degrees per second here. And we do know the F-35 can go faster. We've seen it at other shows, typically clocking in at about 17 degrees per second. sets the F-35 apart from fourth generation fighters is not the ordnance it can carry, it's certainly not how far or how fast it can fly. The real advantage is with the avionics, the data sharing, situational awareness, detection avoidance and survivability. For example, the F-35 uses its suite of avionics as a single cohesive system. Its active electronically scanned array radar is both a sensor and a weapon. It helps to chart and visualise the battle space, but it also forms part of the F-35's electronic warfare package, shaping and disrupting that very same battle space. Likewise, the F-35's navigation, communication and tracking systems are all integrated into a single unit. The electronic warfare suite will soon also be integrated into that unit, allowing a comprehensive, all-encompassing and highly automated approach to battle space management. Pedal turn here, swinging the nose round at about 25 degrees per second at 50 degrees of alpha, so a much lower turn rate and angle of attack than the Su-35's pedal turn a few moments ago. But remember, this is not a thrust vectoring aircraft. This is all being achieved in wingborne flight using the aerodynamic control surfaces. multi-role fighter, but many air arms, the United States and Italy for example, primarily use the F-35 in the strike and suppression of enemy air defences roles due to their advanced sensors and low observability. This is probably the last air show appearance for the US Air Force's long-standing F-35 display pilot Major Kristen Wolfe, who's coming to the end of her third and final season flying the jet at air shows. She will shortly hand over to a new pilot who will take the reins for the next three years. Earlier on in the programme, we saw the UAE's soon-to-be-retired Mirage 2000. The F-35 was one of the options that the country considered as a replacement for it, but in the end they settled on the Dassault Rafale.
The UAE ordered 80 Rafales of the latest F4 standard in late 2021, making them the jet's largest export customer. This has probably brought to a halt the UAE's plans to procure the fifth generation F-35 Lightning II or the Su-75 Checkmate, at least for the time being. The Rafale F-4 was available quicker than the Su-57 and with fewer political preconditions than the F-35, but it boasts comparable capabilities to fifth generation fighters in many respects, apart from stealth. Compared to the F-3R Rafale we see here, the F-4 standard Rafale will boast an improved helmet-mounted display, long-range passive stealth target detection, new radar tracking modes, a satellite-based communication link and larger cockpit display screens. The F-4 will have the same epic manoeuvrability as the aircraft we see in front of us, which is just demonstrating a sustained turn at 20 degrees per second, and that's the best turn performance we've seen today by a considerable margin. Roll performance are also absolutely unmatched, as high as 265 degrees per second in this display, and that's uh, about 50% faster than most of the other rolling manoeuvres we've seen at the show. It's all the more impressive given this is a twin-engined aircraft and generally speaking, twins don't roll so well. They've got more inertia from those side-by-side -side engines and that does compromise roll performance. Dasso solved that problem by putting the engines really close together. Uh, it does involve some other compromises. If you've got a problem with one engine, it's more likely to affect the other just because of proximity. Uh, but you do get fantastic instability in roll, as this display has demonstrated. As far as weapons go, the Rafale F-4 will be compatible with various new systems including the Hammer 1000kg bomb and the Mika-NG, a BVR fire-and-forget missile designed for use against stealth targets. And how about this for a landing? We saw earlier on the F-15 entering a high alpha pass straight out of a reverse half Cuban. Well, this is in a way comparable. A reverse half Cuban to land, up to 60 degrees nose high, half a roll, extend the gear over the top and then pull straight through onto short final. That is the conclusion of a tremendous display widely acknowledged as setting the benchmark in terms of fast jet solo display choreography. One manoeuvre flowing effortlessly into the next with barely a single second when the jet was flying straight and level. Incidentally, that was the final show for the outgoing Rafale display pilot, Capitaine Bertrand Bertin. He'll be handing over to a new pilot for the next two seasons. We saw al Vazan Al-Emirat not too long ago. Well, here is the team that provided their initial training and inspiration, the Frecce Tricolori.
They're flying as a 9-ship this week rather than a 10-ship as usual, but special care has been taken to make sure all the formations and manoeuvres are still symmetrical. The Frecce Tricolori are regular visitors to the Middle East, but other than that they rarely leave Europe. That'll change next year though, with a two-month tour to North America from mid-June until mid-August. It's a really complex display routine this, particularly in terms of the rejoins that the main formation have to do out of sight of the crowd. That is made possible by unusually slow pilot turnover that means every pilot gets to really nail their part of the show over several years. This year marked the 100th anniversary of the first independent Italian air arm. The occasion was celebrated at a quite unforgettable air show at Pratica di Mare in June, which told the entire history of the Aeronautica Militare by putting up such types as the CA-3, P-38, F-104 and G-91 into the sky, as well as more than 100 aircraft from the modern Italian Air Force. Indeed, we covered that event on Airshow Dispatches. It's Series 6, Episode 5. I said, did I not, that Alvazan and the Frecce Tricolori drew their hearts in rather different ways. The Frecce, the only team in the world to draw a heart from bottom to top. The Aeronautica Militare also celebrated its centenary with numerous special schemes. The Frecce Tricolori have received the special scheme treatment. Most of the aircraft in their fleet bear special tails this year. Six designs in total, four of which commemorate specific historic squadrons, while the other two designs mark the centenary in more general terms. Sadly, for such a momentous year, the Frecce Tricolori have had a fairly torrid season. Only five, Capitano Alessio Gersi was killed just a few days before the first show of the year in an ultralight accident, and then in the middle of the season a takeoff accident claimed the life of one person on the ground. Both those accidents, it must be said, were unrelated to display flying itself. It has been more than 20 years since their last accidents during a show or a practice, and 35 years since their last fatality. That is a safety record that any aerobatic team would be envious of. They really do operate to the highest safety standards. I mentioned during Alvazan that there are only two jet aerobatic teams in the world which fly a Lomchevac. Alvazan was one, the Frecce Tricolori of course is the other, and here it is, into the vertical, two rolls, two spins, and then silence. And it is with the solo flying that you can most clearly see the influence of the Frecce Tricolori on their Emirati counterparts. The solo manoeuvres are pretty well identical between the two teams, although Alvazan have gone their own way with the formation element of the show. And now the main formation arrives for possibly one of my favourite manoeuvres, and one which we don't see them fly at many overseas air shows. Rollbacks first of all, and then the team will go up into a loop.
on the down line. They split for the bomber with the soloist going up through the middle. But it's not over. The aircraft charge away from us and then all eight pull up into half Cubans to run back towards show centre for a very impressive eight ship cross. This, as I mentioned, not possible in many countries because it usually requires several aircraft to pass over the spectator area, but the showground here in Dubai is pretty compact. It's just about small enough that they can make it work without any crowd overflights. Like Alvazan's jets, these AT-339PANs will soon be due for retirement. They are expected to be replaced by the T-345 high-efficiency trainer. The first T-345s were delivered in 2020 and were inducted into the training role in 2021. known exactly when the Freccia Tricolori will start using them. Initially the target date was in the late 2010s but evidently that has slipped somewhat and I don't think you'll find many people complaining about that because these AT339s are delightfully charismatic aircraft to watch in a way that the T345 probably won't be. Just as Fazan al Emirat is capable of leaving the most incredible smoke patterns hanging in the sky at the end of their show, so too is the Frecce Tricolori. This is the final manoeuvre as the team draw the largest Italian flag in the world, pierced by the soloist. So that's it, a fitting finale to the Dubai Air Show 2023, and this time it really is the end of our extended sixth series of air show dispatches. You can watch all 11 episodes from this year for free now, featuring air shows in the USA, the UK, Italy, France, Poland, Australia, Malaysia, and of course, the UAE. But from me, Adam Landau, from Dubai, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>